Hello and welcome to a Talmud Israeli production. Today we'll review the highlights of this week's course of Dafyomi study, Masechet Yevamot, pages 41 through 47. Mem Aleph. Tanu Rabbanan. Yevamash Tlashach Rashim Rishonim, Nizonet Mishel Baal. So, a woman whose husband died and she has the status of a Yevamah, she's awaiting Yibum. For the first three months of her widowhood, she is sustained by money uh, provided by the estate of her hu- or deceased husband. But after three months, she no longer is sustained by the estate of her deceased husband, and she's not sustained by her potential Yavam. However, if the Yavam was taken to court and was supposed to agree to either perform the mitzvah of Yibum or perform the mitzvah of Chalitza and refuse and ran away, at that point the onus is on him to make sure that this widow doesn't starve, and so she is supported from his assets. Membet. Machloket v'achakachstam halachakestam. What happens if there is an anonymous Mishnah, um, but there is also a halachic dispute of Tanaim recorded elsewhere in the Mishnah? How do we follow? What halacha do we follow? Do we follow the anonymous opinion? Or do we have to decide from conflicting opinions in the Machloket? The answer is it depends which occurs first in the text. If you have a machloket first, a dispute, with different recorded opinions, and then there's the stam, there's the anonymous Mishnah, halacha kestam, we follow the, the second one, the anonymous one. Stam machlokes, however, if the anonymous one comes first, and the dispute comes second, and halacha kestam, we do not follow the anonymous one, rather we follow the latter one. So in both instances, we follow whatever comes second. If there is an anonymous Mishnah, which seems to be at odds with a b'raita that it records a tanedik machloket, we follow the anonymous Mishnah. Machloket b'matitin. What if it's a disputed Mishnah? Or some b'raita and an anonymous b'raita? What do we do? Do we follow the anonymous b'raita? The answer is, Rabbi loshna, Rabbi Well, if Rabbi did not issue a machloket, uh, did, did not issue it a ruling, but rather had a machloket, then how would Rabbi Chia, the author of the b'raita, know which way to rule? That he, should, that he should issue a stam. He wouldn't know. Therefore, we ignore the b'raita and fall back upon the machloket in the Mishnah. Mem Gimel, 43. Tanya Korim Hazman Azeh, before Tisha B'Av, in the week before Tisha B'Av, Mematin B'Yizkehem, the people reduce the scope of their commercial activities. And we don't do as much building, and for that matter, as much planting. Um Asin, however, you're allowed to get betrothed. You can betroth a woman, erusin. Have a low consent, but you cannot do the chuppah. You cannot finalize the marriage. And we don't make a feast in the week before Tisha B'Av to, uh, take, to mark the celebration of the betrothal, the erusin. Now, the question is, if it's not a time of happiness, and we're not going to allow a chuppah, a nisuin, why do we allow erusin? And the answer is, Shema Yikad Menu Acher. If this man is not able at this time to marry this girl because of calendrical interference, maybe some other man will whisk her away and he'll lose his, out his shiduch, his matrimonial prospects. Mem Dalad. Hamachazir Gerushato. If a person were, to, a man were to remarry his ex-wife and that ex-wife had in the intervening time married somebody else, which is forbidden for him to remarry such a woman, or he marries the woman to whom he gave chalitza, also a forbidden thing. Yotzi, they ha- this marriage has to be broken up. There has to be a divorce. We have lad mamzer, and the child born of that union is a mamzer child. So says Rabbi Akiva. However, chachamim omrim and of lad mamzer, the sages say the child is not a mamzer. The marriage is not a valid marriage. Is not a kosher marriage. It has to be busted up. But the, ch- the child is not a mamzer. Why is there this machloket? Because in the view of the sages, the child's only a mamzer if the union is forbidden on pain of karet. However, these are only forbidden on pain of a simple lav, a, a negative commandment. Whereas Rabbi Akiva says, even if never, for a simple negative commandment, the child has the status of a mamzer. Mem hey. Rava Achshrei of Mari Barachel, Mani Prasimid Bavel. So Rava declared to be uh, that a certain person was kosher and appointed this person among the officers of the, of the community in Babylonia. Who was this individual? Rav Mari Bar Rachel. Rav Mari Bar Rachel was the son of Rachel, as his name indicates. 
Ordinarily, we would identify someone by their father's name, but his father actually was a non-Jew, who later converted. But when, he, when the child was conceived, the father was a non-Jew. So the question is, are you allowed to appoint to a position of authority someone who's half Jewish, but the right half, the mother was Jewish? So clearly, in the view of Rava, this is allowed. Even though the Bible says you shall place upon yourself a king, that all the appointments that you make for positions of authority shall be people from among your nation. So, is this person from among your nation? Yes, because his mother was Jewish, he has the status of he's like a native born son. Memvav, 46. Tanu Rabbanan, Ger if a, if a prospective proselyte tries to convert to Judaism and does circumcision, but does not immerse in the mikvah, Rabbi Eliezer says he's Jewish. It counts. What happens now? Why? Because our ancestors in Mitzrayim, uh, our ancestors in the days of old, in patriarchal times, they had circumcision, but they did not have immersion. What happens if you have immersion but no circumcision? Rabbi Yeshua says, that's kosher, raise a gear. Why? Because the imahot, the matriarchs, they immersed but had no circumcision, obviously. Whereas the sages say you require both. If you have one or the other, but not both of them, you're not a convert to Judaism until both procedures are implemented. Okay, Memzai. Tanu Rabbanan. Ushvatetem said that you shall judge righteously, justly, between man and his fellow and his, and his stranger. From here we see that if a convert converts to Judaism in the context of a rabbinical court, in front of a Beit Din, that is a valid conversion. However, if it's privately, with no one else watching, nobody around, no authority figures of Judaism function as the gatekeepers, that is not a valid conversion. So all proselytism must be in the context of a community in front of the religious authorities of the Beit Din. Everyone have a great week. Mo'adim l'simcha.